Now, you're not going to get any entertainment tonight. I'm not going to draw for you. And uh, in a sense, I'm not going to even preach at you tonight. I'm just going to talk with you. This is a men's meeting, and so we're just going to talk about some male things here tonight. And I'm going to talk to you a while tonight about the, the world's ten most wanted men. You know, back in the old days, we used to have signs around the post office that says, Wanted, dead or alive. And I have a fellow's picture there. And wanted to reward $10,000, $20,000. John Dillinger was up there, and the reward for him was about, I uh, was about $300,000 in a day, when that'd be worth now about $2 million. And there are 10 men that God's looking for, and I'm going to talk to you about those men, the Word of God. Now, there are all kinds of places I could start tonight. Uh, there was a man from God whose name was John. There's a place in Jeremiah where he says, I sought for a man to stand in the gap and couldn't find one. There's a place in Jeremiah where the Lord said, if Samuel and Moses and uh, somebody else is here and Job is here, I still wouldn't change my mind about these people. I'd clean them out. But in Psalm 12, verse 1 is the idea. In Psalm 12, verse 1, it says, help, Lord. Why? Now look at the rest of the verse. That fellow's not praying for help because he's sick. He's not praying for help because he's out of money. He's not praying for help because his wife left him. Not because of the Antichrist is coming. He's not praying for wealth because of tribula help because of the tribulation is coming. He's not praying for help for any reason that most people pray for help. All right, the verse says, Help, Lord, for what? For the godly man ceaseth. See that? For the faithful fail from among the children of men. Now, that's a statement that when the godly man and faithful man cease in a country, that country's in trouble. And when he says help, he's saying we need some help because the godly fellows are gone and the faithful men are gone. Well, bless this message tonight. May the Holy Spirit of God be our guide, lead, and teacher in this hour. And we pray the Holy Spirit of God will teach from the scriptures tonight uh, what, what you want, what you're looking for in this group here tonight that are men. And especially among those of us to know thee as Savior. And we pray for any unsaved here tonight. They'll not be unsaved when they leave this building tonight. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Recently, a great man died and was taken away from our, our midst. His name is Lester Roloff. Another man was taken a few years back, Brother Bob Jones Sr. When I first got saved, I used to be like some of you are. How many of you have been saved less than five years? All right, when you get in church and get singing about singing that beautiful shore, the melodious song of the blessed and the sweet by and by and seeing your loved ones, the truth is uh, you can't put a lot into it because you haven't got very many loved ones there. Just been saved a couple of years. You get talking about seeing all your friends in heaven. You haven't got a lot of friends in heaven. All your friends are in hell or they're going there. And I remember I used to sing those songs about getting home to glory and seeing my friends and I felt kind of peculiar because I didn't know anybody in heaven. My mother wasn't saved, my father wasn't saved, my brother wasn't saved, my sister wasn't saved, my wife and children were saved, but they weren't dead yet. I didn't know anybody in heaven. And then as the years went by, they began to drop off. A fellow named McKay up in Ohio that did my taping for me, he went. A friend that ran a service band center in Pensacola, Clay Hadley, touched the 440 volt line, he went. And the Lord called Dr. DeHaan home, he went. And the Lord called Bob Jones Sr. home, and he went. Then Beach and Vic, one of the best friends I ever had, went. Then Alex Dunlap, head of the conversion center in Philadelphia, went. And uh, now the ranks are getting thinner and thinner. And the man that got me to preaching, Glenn Shunk, he's gone. And my song leader, Bob Person, he's gone. And they're going. And every now and then, Lord, reach over and take a fellow you think you can't do without. It's uh, too bad the Lord took Lester all off home. I know the Lord knows what he's doing. He's bound to, because <laughs> he's the Lord. But you wonder why it takes a fellow like Lester to roll off and leaves a fellow like Truman Dollar. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you wonder about those things. You wonder why they don't take a fellow like uh, Beach and Vic home or Alex Dunlap and leave Bob Jones and Jimmy Swagger. I mean, you got to take somebody. You wonder sometimes why he picks them where he does. And the Lord took Lester to roll off home. He took a home man who had some courage, some guts. And that's one of the things the Lord's looking for. Now, if you've never read a little poem by Rudyard Kipling called If, you ought to get it. And I doubt if Rudyard Kipling was a saved man, but he was a man. And he has a program, he has a poem called If. 
And the gist of it is, if you can do this and not do this, and do this and not do this, and do this without losing this, and do this without getting this, you'll be a man. That's a very good poem. One of the best ever been written. It's real scriptural. One other thing in there is if you can walk with kings and uh, not lose the common touch, and all men count all things with you, but not too much. See? It's one of those things that show you how to get your balance. And it's a good poem. Now, I'm going to talk tonight about the world's ten most wanted men. These are ten men that we need. And if you're one of these men, you're needed. And the world needs you, the body of Christ needs you, your family needs you. And if you're not one of these ten men, uh, we don't need you. And the world doesn't need you. And if you're not one of these ten, why, well, you're just filling up space and get out of the way and let somebody else come in who can do something. <laughs> like a fellow said, get out of the way, we're trying to get something done here. You're just standing in the way. There are ten wanted men. Now, the first man we're looking for is a man who will put principle ahead of expediency. By that, I mean a man who will make his decisions based on what's right and what's wrong instead of what's good or what's bad. You understand the difference? You don't look like you understand the difference. Eve looked at the tree and it was good for food. Amen? Pleasant to the eyes, desire to make one wise. It was all good, all positive. Right? Killed her. What you do is a bunch of fellows who make the decision not upon what's good or what's bad or what's profitable or what's unprofitable, but what's right and what's wrong. Now, we need a man like, men like that, and there are many of them around. We get preaching in the street, and, uh, and our church members show up and say, well, what good does that do? I'll tell you the answer. The answer is, who cares? If it's right, you do it whether it does any good or not. Amen. Now, you're living in a modern day and age when Christians don't even understand that kind of talk. They keep looking for what good could come up. What can I get out of it? What can the body of Christ get out of it? What can people get out of it? That isn't even the point. The point is, if it's right, do it, and if it's wrong, quit it. And you get going like that, and you have a hard time with the Christians. Some of you have trouble with things in your life, and you say, uh, well, Brother Rutten, I don't appreciate you talking about them. I've heard everything preached on this meeting, I believe, except mustaches. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got an old friend down in North Carolina who says the fellow wears a mustache to cover his upper lip because a leper has to cover his upper lip because he's unclean. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, laugh, won't kill you, it won't kill you. You say, do you believe that? I don't know if I believe that, but he'll preach in anything, man. He'll preach in, <laughs> he'll preach in Hershey bars if he can't get us nails. Now, the thing is to find a man who'll do right. If it's right, do it. If it's wrong, quit it. Uh, if you can't quit it, kick yourself around the block. Don't you get upset with me, you spoiled brat. If it's right, go on, do it. If I was sitting where you're sitting, you'd stand where I'm standing, and you're talking like I'm talking right now, you know what I'd do if I thought I was right? I'd just go ahead and do it. You, you, you wouldn't rock my jock, man. I wouldn't move a half, a half an inch. If I thought I was right, I'd do it, no matter what you said. Folks come to church and they say, I don't believe preach guy been this talking about that kind of thing. Well, you say that because you're a spoiled brat. If it's right, do it. If it's wrong, quit it. And if you can't quit it, kick yourself around the bushes. It's your problem, it isn't mine. Amen, amen, amen. Robert, Robert E. Lee, if you don't know who he is, you've got to go hang yourself. <laughs> Robert E. Lee, Robert E. Lee, at the end of, of the Civil War, retired, and one day a man came to him and offered him $50,000 a year to use his name in, in an insurance company. The Robert E. Lee Insurance Company. He could have got 50000 a year just for the rights to use his name. You know what Robert E. Lee said? He said, if my name is so valuable, I'd better guard its integrity. And he wouldn't do it. Joe Namath would let you use his name to sell a pair of silk stockings. <laughs> you know what that shows you? That shows you Robert E. Lee was a better man dead than Joe Namath was alive. <laughs> Now, you see, this kind of talk upsets folk, but I'm talking about principle. I'm talking about doing the thing on the basis of right or wrong, not the base of what it can get. One time a slave was being sold down to Orleans, great big old fellow, he'd given the trader a hard time coming over, 
and he was asking questions about him, and he finally said to the Negro before he bought him, he said, if I buy you, will you be honest? And that black man looked him in the face and said, I'll be honest whether you buy me or not. <laughs> That's right. In plain words, if it's right to be honest, be honest whether you get anything from it or not. The trick is to find a guy who will go by principle and conviction instead of by expediency. That's the problem. Rudyard Kipling gave a talk one time to the young graduates at uh, Oxford years ago, back in the 1890s. And when he finished his talk, he had a kind of feeling he hadn't reached them. And as he left the platform, he said these words. He said, young man, you dress well. Your manners are flawless. Your dress is impeccable. He said, your education is the finest in the country. Evidently, you came from very rich homes. And he said, evidently, your father's had a good bit of money. You couldn't have, some of you couldn't have come here. And he said, someday after you've left this institution, many, many years later down the line somewhere, you're going to run to a man somewhere to whom money means absolutely nothing. And he said, when you do, you'll see how poor you really are. All right, number two. Second most wanted man. A man who is dependable instead of gifted. We've got a thing going where if anybody has talent, they're in another bracket from these poor dumb folks that don't have talent. And Bob Jones Sr. used to say the greatest ability is dependability. God has a want ad column in the Bible. Did you ever read it? Did you ever read his want ad column? Who can find a virtuous woman? That's the want ad column. To Isaiah, who will go for me in the Psalms? Who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? Is there not a prophet in Israel? The Lord's always saying, where's the man? Where's the man? Where's the man? Where's a dependable man? You take when this country gets in trouble like the... If, would, you li would you like to have been one of the hostages in Iran? Knowing how dependable your government was? <laughs> you fellows in Vietnam that fought in Vietnam, you sure got in one flat-footed mess, I'll tell you, man. Uh, if you went, I have more power to you, but I'd assure you hate to be over there that thing of the kind of government we got. Korea was bad enough without Vietnam. You can't depend upon the government. You take right now, I don't have any senator in Congress that represents me. Bible says you shouldn't have taxation without representation. I don't have any member of the Congress that represents me. Absolutely not. I don't know one man in either house that believes what I believe, to stand for what I stand for. They're not dependable. I don't trust any congressman as far as I can kick this bill in the left foot. I mean, but they don't represent me. I don't know who they represent. They don't represent me. They're not dependable. You can't count on them. One time, a boy went to a store and said, I'd like to get a job. The man said, how old are you, son? He said, 15. He said, what experience you had? The kid said, none. And he said, what can you do? And he said, I can do what I'm told. Got the job. You know why some of you fellows have such a hard time finding employment? You can't do what you're told. They come down to our school all the time and come down there, and some of them really live by faith. They live off other people's money, what they do. And they come down there. I've, I've had guys come to our school 20 and 21 years old, nothing but just a bunch of bums. And I, they, we got one of those churches where everybody helps everybody out and brings groceries to everybody and tries to pay the hospital bill and everything else. And... That's a good place for a freeloader to come in and get out and get some folks to carry them. And I warn my people, don't just hand out to anybody. You check a guy before you hand out to him, make sure he's willing to work. Because they're not dependable, they're lazy. They're lazy. Loafers. They come down there and there's three fifty an hour. Who wants three fifty an hour? Well, it's better than eating dirt. <laughs> Come down, I can't find a job. I can't find a job. I've got three boys, Pete, Mike, and David. None, none, none of them ever had any trouble getting a job. They're grown men now. They began to work when they were 16 to 17. None of them had trouble finding a job. Mike pretended he did once. Mike. But when I put the screws to him, he found one in about 24 hours. <laughs> and a fellow acts like he can't get a job, but the truth is he can't get the kind of job he wants. I mean, he's, he's somebody, at least he has a special talent that nobody else has. And the job is not up to his gifts. <laughs> well, we don't need any of those fellows. 
What you need is dependable men. Fritz Kreis played the violin, practiced eight hours a day. So Walter Scott made a covenant with God to write one book every two months. Every two months. I haven't done that good. John Wesley made a covenant with God to preach three times a day, and I think he did. Three times a day, over 900 sermons a year. You count on him. 1849, when New Year's Eve came around, General William Booth got out a sheet of paper and wrote out the New Year's resolutions. I'll read them for you. This is General William Booth. This year I will try to rise every morning before 6.30, have daily prayer, avoid all idle talking, in which lately I have sinfully indulged, conduct myself as a humble follower of the breathing lamb, read four chapters a day in the Bible, live closer to God, a holy life leaving providence to God, and they will read this over every day, this list of resolutions. May God help me to cultivate a spirit of self-denial and yield myself as a prisoner of Christ to the Redeemer of the world. Amen, amen. General William Muth, you could depend upon him. You could count upon him. That fellow, when he died, the day before he died, he was weeping in the bed, and they asked him what he was crying for. Did he hurt? And he said, I'm weeping because this morning you brought me poached eggs for breakfast. And he said, there are people starving in London. Dependable. Count on it. All right, number three. The Lord is looking for a man who put the blame on himself instead of somebody else. Hardest thing for some men to do is be able to seem to be, to be able to take the blame. Did you ever have to apologize to somebody you didn't like? I'd rather suffer on the rack, man. I'd rather suffer in the rack. I'll tell you the worst, about the worst thing I ever had to do after I got saved. A couple of my boys got real wild, and I got some wild young men down there. I have to kind of keep a, a leash on them, you know. I can't turn them loose. They make me look like a martyr, honest to goodness. I got two guys down there. If you want to beat me up, you better have to try when those two guys are around. I mean, they'll fix your wagon, but good. I got two ex-street fighters, jailbirds down there. They're just weak and just begging for a chance to knock somebody's head off. <laughs> and one of them told me one time, he said, I'm going up to Greenville, South Carolina this week. You want to have me punch Custer in the mouth for you? <laughs> and I said, no, 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 don't, don't, don't do it. And, and he'd do it. The guy'd do it. He'd do it and go to jail and just laugh at him. And you take an eye a couple of wild birds down there. They go in the Catholic churches and turn the statues upside down, you know. <laughs> blowing out the candles, you know, and all this and that. And one of them went down there and got right up in Catholic Mass. I mean, St. Francis, St. Mary, St. some other. Sunday morning, got right up on the rail and preached Hebrews 10 to them. You know, one, one sacrifice. Boy, they called, they called... Smokey, and he came in and picked him up, you know, and the fellows took him off and got bail on him, and I had to go to apologize to that priest. I'm in his church. It's his property. They got their rights, too, you know. Can you see me apologize to a priest? <laughs> I almost rather lost a limb, man. I just said that, yeah, 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 well, you know, I sure am sorry, Mr. So-and-so. He said, you call me father. I'll call you mister, you know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't call him father. I don't call him father. But I had to go down there and take the blame for those boys and apologize for that rascal, and it'll bring you down. Uh, we are, by nature, we're egotistical. We think about ourselves. Did you ever, did you ever hear little children play? I saw two boys on a tricycle one time, and the boy on the tricycle said, if one of us would get off, I could ride this thing. <laughs> you know what he's talking about. I saw a bunch of kids one time in the yard, and one of them, the leader, got up and said, let's play Zorro, I'll be Zorro. That's how, how we are, you know. And the thing is, God's looking for a man who won't turn and say, the woman thou gavest me, she gave me, and I did eat. Uh, you always tend to blame somebody else. So I lose something. I almost... Almost always, the first thing I think of is somebody stole it. I always think, I don't care what I lost, somebody stole it. And sometimes it did, but most of the time it didn't. Most of the time I just misplaced it. You say, I'm so, oh, why I'm so quick to do that? Because I was a thief for years, man, for years. And entering and breaking the second story, soft touch, man. To this day, I, I hear a siren, I get nervous. <laughs> and I haven't stolen anything. 
I haven't stole anything, but just that. I don't like that sound. <laughs> I've run from that sound at night, boy. I've had them come out the 38s and shooting bullets up by up the chimney, you know, trying to get away from them at night when I was a boy, you know. I mean, you know, 15, 16. And when I lose some, first thing I think of somebody stole it. And many times I've had to apologize to the Lord for in my own heart accusing somebody of taking, picking the thing up when I just misplaced it. It does a fellow good to apologize. And along that line, you know that I'm strictly macho, but along that line, I think some of you fellows uh, ought to make it a habit to apologize to your wife at least once a week about something. Because <laughs> you're probably not that holy. You're probably not that sanctified. I don't like to do that either. I don't like to do that either. I hate to say to my wife, I'm sorry, it was my fault. I mean, she got so many, why should I encourage her? <laughs> <laughs> but do you, know, do you know what cross-bearing amounts to, actually, gentlemen? Cross-bearing actually amounts to denying self. And nothing in the world would do your flesh better from the standpoint of the Lord's standpoint than to put it down. And one of the best ways to be put down is by going to somebody whose guts you hate or don't like or don't appreciate when you owe them an apology and apologize to them, ask them to forgive you. Good for you. Make your flesh just crawl. And that's good for the flesh. Good for the flesh to be put down. All right, number four. Here's a man God wants. World's most wanted man. A man who prays with his wife. Amen. Instead of at her. <laughs> um, did you ever get praying with your wife? Find yourself praying, you know, you know, for what's wrong with her. <laughs> Well, that stuff should be taken care of some other time. When you get praying, you ought to be praying for her. You ought to be praying with her. And it's very difficult. You fellows, I don't know how many of you fellows pray with your wife, read the Bible to your wife. I know how women are. I mean, uh, you get uh, reading the Bible to your wife, you know, and her mind gets worn, she's thinking about something else, you know, or she goes to sleep. I bet my wife go to sleep while reading the Bible. That's a real blessing, you know. <laughs> and then you say, she's saved. Yes, she's saved. She's saved, but she's female. And the Lord made that woman, he made a strange thing. Amen. That woman is a strange thing, boy. I'll tell you, the best are sharper than a briar. <laughs> and you get praying to your wife, you know what you feel like? When she's praying, you feel like she's just talking to Celie. You ever need your wife and pray with your wife and get that feeling? Maybe you don't. I have. I have. I've, 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 heard, I've got that feeling many times some other guy's wife was praying. And the thing is, you, you fellas just have to remember that you, of that woman's head, it's God here and Christ there and you there and the woman below you. That's the setup in 1 Corinthians. And if that woman doesn't strike you as being as spiritual as she ought to be, uh, you help her. You help her and you pray with her and you pray for her. And if you're going to pray against her, then do that alone sometime where she can't hear it. You get her defeated in this that. Something there, her character needs to be fixed up. Pray for it away from her. When you're with her, pray with her. Now, some of you fellows have, I say that some of you fellows are already on a conviction because you've got a more spiritual life than you are. Some of you guys. Some of you guys, the prayer war in your family is your wife. It ain't you. And some of you, you ain't the head of the house she is. But I'm talking about where you're the head of the house and you're the spiritual one. You ought to be helping in prayer. Now, if you're not the head of the house, that's something else. I mean, are you a man or a mouse? fellow said, give me a piece of cheese and you'll find out. <laughs> I'm, always, I'm always suspicious of a man that's too bossy out in the world. That makes me nervous. Whenever I find an overseer of a plant, or a superintendent of a factory, or a guy in an office who's a big swinging the weight around all day long, they make me nervous. You know what I always suspect? I always suspect like that little boy was hiding under the bed when his daddy came up to beat him, whip him. He had to crawl in the bed to get him. And the little boy said, is mama after you too? <laughs> <laughs> I, read about a, I read about a crook one time who was getting the third degree and after an hour of it, this back in the old days when the police could beat him up and shine a light in the face, you know. And after about an hour of the third degree, he was just saying, yes, dear, yes, dear, yes, dear. <laughs> 
Those fellows always make me nervous because I've observed on many occasions when a guy like that, the reason why he's like that is because he can't run his home. Gets outside of his home, takes it out on the employees, people work for him. <laughs> All right, number five. A man that's wanted. A man who pays his bills when they do. When these men cease, the nation ceases. When these men go, the nation's gone. Our government doesn't pay its bills. Our government says, talk about the deficit spending this year. Will we balance the budget? Come on, who's trying to kid who? Nobody's balanced the budget since World War I. All this stuff. You know what they're saying? They're saying, this year we've got it balanced if we don't go in the hole more than we went last year. How far are you in? Oh, $3 trillion, something like that. I don't know what it is. We used to talk about 40 and 50 billion. By the time we got 900 billion, folks just lost track of it. Now, if a country doesn't pay its debt, it goes bankrupt. And if a man doesn't pay his debt, he goes bankrupt. Now, let me ask you something. When it comes to paying off debts, who do you owe your first? You owe the world or the Lord? A man named A.A. A. Hyde, who became a millionaire, they call him Praying Hyde. He became a millionaire before he died. That old boy tied when he was $110,000 in debt. They came around him and said, how come you're doing that when you owe the money to other people? He said, uh, I owed the Lord before I owed them, and I'm going to pay the Lord first and pay them if I have anything left. Now, I'm not too sure about that theology. I just know the guy did it, and before he got through, he wound up a millionaire. The world looking for people who can pay the bills. You know some of you Christian fellows here? The world will forgive you for stepping out in your way if your wife isn't behaving herself. And the world will forgive you for messing up and going out to get drunk, even after you've been off liquor 10 or 15 years if you clean up and try to get right. The world, I know I'm the saved man, they understand those things. But I'll tell you something they'll not forgive you for. for. They'll not forgive you for not paying your bills. Those on the saved people want their money when their money is due. And if you don't pay your bills and the due, your testimony ain't worth nothing, no matter how holy and spiritual you are, how many souls you win to Christ, or what the Lordship of Christ is and all this and that, you don't pay that thing with nothing to do, then I'm going to say, fellow, mark you off. Pushing the bottom line. Get mighty quiet in there, preacher. Next, we're looking for a man who brings his children to church instead of sending them. This country is cursed with fellows who send the church off to kids off the church. And Sunday school, Sunday morning. Amen. Or have the wife send them, you know. The boy says, Dad, did you go to Sunday school when you were a boy? Yes. Well, I guess it won't do me any good either. <laughs> I mean, the old man isn't going. <laughs> you know what they say down the south? They say, well, I don't go to church anymore, preacher, because when I was a boy, my people made me go. I just had to go all the time. I got sick and tired of going because I had to go all the time. You know what they say up here? They say, well, I never had to go, so I never got in the habit. <laughs> Either way, they're just trying to get out of it. Let me ask you gentlemen this. Your children ever see you pray? You got boys and girls ever see you on your knees? Your son or ever daughter ever seen you in a chair with a Bible in your lap? I mean, never mind about down here at the church carrying the Bible out. They ever see you in living room with a thing in your lap? They've seen you watching the belly dancers at 11 o'clock at night. You know, the Johnny Carson show, you know, the, somebody, you know, sitting there not enough clothes on to wad a shotgun with. <laughs> do, they, do your kids know you pray? Let me ask you this. Your boys and girls, did they ever see you pass out of track? Never mind the preacher. You, daddy. Ever see daddy pass out of track? I might be talking to some man here tonight, and maybe some man here tonight, your kid never even seen you pray at the table. Probably not. Most folks ask the grace, they ask the blessing, you know, before they eat, but maybe not. My daddy was an unsaved man. My daddy, every every time we sat down at the meal, he'd say, Lord, help us to be truly thankful for what we're about to receive. Amen. I ain't much of a prayer. It isn't in Jesus' name, but at least it was something, you know. And remind me of a joke we have about two Irishmen who were crossing the field and a bull got after him, got chasing him. And one of them said, Patrick, do something quick. And he said, what will I do? He said, pray. And Patrick knelt and said, Lord, help us to be truly thankful for what we're about to receive. 
Why, down there, down south, we had a ball game one time. We all kneel before we pray. I mean, my team does. The rest of them stand up. My team kneels, get in the dirt. The other teams come out in shorts. We come out with pants on, down with down the ankle, and get out. Just trying to be pious, and no, we're trying to show them something. I'm trying to show them the difference. And get down there and pray. One of the asked one of those teams to pray one time. The guy knelt down the side and said, "God is great. God is good. Lord, we thank thee for this food." And Jesus, you know, <laughs> pitiful man. The only prayer he knew was the blessing at the table. You know, all that stuff. Did, did you, do your kid, have your kids ever seen you uh, on your knees? Have ever seen you walking up down the backyard talking to the Lord? I mean, I all this list, all this, all this preaching is fine. I preach it. You had good preaching this week. Thank God for it. All the pious stuff is fine. It's real. I believe in it. I believe in it. We're just getting right down to where where you're at. Your boys and girls know that Daddy loves God and loves the book and loves souls and spends the time with God. Your children. And I don't care about the world, the church, the body of Christ, your kids. All right, next. Ten most wanted men, number seven. We need a man who give God the glory for any success. Our world is cursed by a bunch of people who never give God the glory for nothing. Amen. President Reagan gets in the office. I thank God he got in. I mean, he's improving almost anything. Last five elections, you could choose between the lesser of two evils or the evil of two lessers. <laughs> and you take, I, I watched Hoover go in, FDR go in, Truman go in, Eisenhower go in, Johnson go in, Kennedy go in. So I've sat through the whole thing, man. 1920, 1930, 1940, 1950, 1960, 1970. Reagan is the first father that got in that tried to do what he said he was going to do. Now, he hadn't done it, and he ain't going to do it. <laughs> but he's trying. Trying. And of course, he's trying with the press giving him a fit. So thank God for that. But I'd have thought so much for, more for him if the day he'd been elected, he'd gone up and thanked God publicly for getting him in and giving the glory to God. And he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. Maybe down to some bunch he met down there last week, he got to preaching, you know, where, you know, where he wasn't on nationwide TV hookup. I want to see a man get on nationwide TV hookup CBS, NBC, Mutual, ABC. And say, I thank God I won that election. I just want to know that uh, I'm here to serve Jesus Christ the best I know how, and I give all the glory to him. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> You're not going to get that. Armstrong steps out of the capsule. Did he give the glory to God? Nah, he didn't give the glory to God. Oh, Cassius Clay gets the, uh, I call him Cassius Clay. You know. I mean, he may be Muhammad Ali, but he has feet of clay. <laughs> <laughs> And he gets the heavyweight crown. He gets the heavyweight crown. Do you hear him say, I just want to thank the Lord for his blessing and help me out and keep me in good health and enable me to do it? Not a word. I am the greatest. I'm going to shut your mouth and just, I want to hire a guy like that to sweep up my hallway, man. Amen, amen, amen. All that self stuff shirt, all that business, big time stuff, I am the greatest. I saw one time uh, some TV somewhere. I saw who's that obnoxious sports fella that just makes you sick? Yeah, Howard Cassell. Yeah, uh, and and he was going back to the dressing room with Foreman. I think it was one of those guys, those colored boxers. And he was trying to get a word from him. And this Foreman, whoever he was, was evidently saved. And going back. How would Cassell say, how'd you do it? Well, the Lord just helped me. The good Lord just, blah, 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 blah. he had Cassell almost in a fit, man. Every time he'd open his mouth, he'd say the wrong thing, and Howard would come in and try to cut him off. And Foreman would say, well, my leg wasn't feeling so good, but I prayed about it, and the Lord, blah, 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 blah. I mean, they can't stand for God to get the glory. <laughs> we don't need any more Howard Cassell. <laughs> we don't need any more Cassius Clay. The less people we have like John Lennon and Belushi, the better off this country is going to be. You want to make this world a better place to live in? Get rid of some of them. <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't tell anybody to kill anybody, and I wouldn't kill them. I wouldn't shoot them. But I ain't going to weep at the grave, man. 
You take some rum, dope-headed, fornicating degenerate like John Lennon gets shot, all I can say was, thank God another one of them is gone. That's all I can say. And folks say, what an attitude. Well, you dirty rascal, you want around to pollute your kids? You want around to mess up some people that are right? Yeah, you're a fine fellow, aren't you? Ain't you something, huh? Boy, ain't you something? You talk about love, you know, and tolerance. Aren't you something? Hey, you're something else. All that business wrote a little parody about Jesus Christ, called him a little yellow stick fascist Spaniard bastard, called Jesus Christ that, and you get upset because he gets yeah. his brain blown out? Yeah. You're a thank God he got him blown out, pray to get him blown out quicker than he got him blown out. Now you take about that giving the glory of God, uh, folks don't do it. We had a fellow in this country named John Stormer that wrote a book called uh, None Dare Call It Treason. Had a great book, a lot of truth in it. Then he got saved. And the next book he wrote was called Death of the Nation. And in that you could tell he was saved with the way he wrote. He had a scripture shot all through that thing. And when he got to the end of that thing, he had an application blank for a decision. <laughs> you never heard of him again, did you? He dropped clean out of sight. There he was, the one of the world's best-selling authors, millions of books, the best-seller of the Book of the Month Club, and the guy gives the glory to God. He's gone, just like that. You never heard of him since. The world you're living in doesn't doesn't give the glory to God. One man like General William Booth is worth ten thousand, like Johnny Carson. One man like Bob Jones Sr. is worth fifty thousand, drunken Dean Martin. You say you don't have right attitude toward those people. I have exactly the right attitude. I got a little girl, I got 12, I got a little girl, 14. I know outside that door, there are two million men that would ruin those girls just quick as look at them. Never ask me for the time of day. I wouldn't ask a bum like Elvis Preston in my house. Fornicating, two-pitted bum. On five prescription drugs and ten more that need prescriptions, According to his two bodyguards, Sonny West and Heber, that took care of him, and Red West, those guys that took care of him for 22 years, according to his bodyguards, he was the most filthy mouth fellows ever lived in the face of this earth. Four other words from morning to night. They just didn't get in his movies. Watching people fornicating through a mirror in the closet and that kind of thing. My, what a fine, upstanding character. Had a relationship with 20 married women and about 40 or 50 single women, that kind of business. Got a kick out of watching people mess around like that? You think I want a dirty animal like that in my living room? I got a dog that's cleaner than that. I'll see some of you don't like that. You know why you don't like that? Because you're rotten yourself. That's your thing. And you appreciate rottenness. You've got a taste for slop. What, what, what we need is a man who will give God the glory and give God the credit. We haven't got him. Sam Jones one time was, uh, had a fellow come up to him, a converted Methodist, uh, converted fellow, and he said, Brother Jones, I'm thinking of leaving the Methodist church. He said, why? And the fellow said, because they're assessing me $150 a year. Back in those days, the Methodists would require so much tithe from you according to how much you made. And Sam said, uh, 150 years, is that right? He said, yeah, that's right. And Sam said, uh, you pretty well off. He said, well, I got a few acres of land. And he said, what you got? He said, well, I got a couple of team oxen. I got about 40 acres out here, a nice home. He said, you always had that? The man said, no, I didn't. One time I had one steer and had to look for land to rent, to plow. And Sam said, how much did you spend on liquor back in those days? And the fellow said, $450 a year. And Sam said, you know what your trouble is? He said, your trouble is you ain't worth shooting. You're the meanest man who ever lived. You gave the devil more than you gave God. I mean, how is it? How is it that you can't give God the glory or even give him that which is rightfully his? Talked to a fellow one time and he said, you're converted? And I said, yeah, I'm converted. He said, how do you know you're converted? I said, keep your ears open just a minute and I'll show you something. Just keep your ears open and listen to me. Now, some will take out one day out of 1949 and one day out of 1980 and see if you can get the difference. I said, 1949, I'm up to 11 o'clock at night with the swinging drums and drinking beer, and they got a fight in the place, and they're throwing beer bottles, and I'm getting back in the corner and getting a chair in one hand and busting off the head off a Coke bottle in the other. You know, a little funny, you've got to take care of yourself any way you can. 
And then about 12 o'clock at night, it settles down. The cops come out, and we pick up the drums and move them down the next joint, set up at 12.30, and play till 6. And I come in at 6 in the morning with a head like I had a sandbag in it, and go to sleep and sleep all day, and get up at 5 o'clock that night, mouth tasting like the swallowed Sahara Desert, and come in there and look in the mirror, and I've got red pimples all over my face breaking out, and got a fever in my eyes, bloodshot, and puking in the face, and go out to play again, pick up another six bucks. That's one night in 1940. That's one day in 49. I'll give you a day in 1980. I get in the morning, 8 o'clock, and kiss my wife goodbye, and my kids, and I go down to the airport and get in a DC-10 and take off at 32,000 feet in there in a brand new suit, and sit down there, and they come by and give me steak and potatoes and butter and ice cream and iced tea at 32,000 feet. I get out of the plane and come down here, and a fellow picks me up and takes me to the Marriott Hotel and gives me the best room in the place and says, if you want a breakfast, just charge the stuff. And I get up that night, preach to a bunch of Christians, and a fellow comes down the aisle and gets saved, and I go back and say my prayers and go to bed at night, sleep like a baby. I said, if you can't tell the difference between those two days, you couldn't see through a plate glass window with a pain knocked out. <laughs> Now you say, what's the difference in those two days? I will tell you the difference. The difference is God. Yes, yeah, so who's, res who's responsible for that? God is responsible for that. All right, number eight. God Almighty needs this. He needs a man who can take persecution cheerfully. Trouble is, we got a whole bunch of fellows these days that have been taught to win, to win, to win. They haven't been taught how to lose. All this crazy stuff, man. You fellows out in sports and follow sports all the time. You've seen it all the time. They get this thing where winning is everything. Everything. The main thing is winning. Yes, he's a winner. He has a real competitive spirit. Yes, he's a great competitive athlete and all this and that. What I want to know is how does he lose? I've seen them. You talk about a mafia. That's a mean looking bunch. <laughs> one is six, one six one, one six two. And those guys are all athletic. And you take, we get that thing, and then I'm I watching those Super Bowl games, watching the losing side, was like, it was like watching prisoners under torture. Here were grown men. I mean, 25, 30, 35 years old standing there. <sighs> Cheer up, sonny. Mama, get you a bottle in a minute. Well, what, what do they pay those fellows for playing in that game? How much? How much? A hundred thousand apiece they pay them? Now you've got something to cry and sniffle over. Imagine the guy picking up that come on and, and, and that man sitting there like the, the, end, the earth has come to an end because they lost a the game. Did you know Christians pick up that stuff? You get watching that stuff, and the first thing you know, you get your britches kicked out, and instead of saying, praise the Lord, hallelujah, you're down the dumps, oh my God, I've lost everything. It's a bad philosophy, brethren. It's a bad philosophy. I think about Mayor Daly up in Chicago. He probably an unsaved Catholic, probably. I don't know the guy, but he probably an unsaved Catholic. But boy, when they had that Democratic convention up there, and all those hippies and yippies and zippies and commies started messing around, he turned the police dogs loose on them. I mean, just take a van downtown, sick him, and open the back door. Good man, worth more money. I mean, the press just cussed him out, called him everything but white. You didn't see him weeping in the beer and sniffling and hollering, you know. Why, how is it an unsafe politician can take persecution better than some of you fellows can? Some of you fellows are people the church get talking about. You ready to quit the church? Aren't you a strange bunch of people? Uh, here a couple of years back, we were preaching down the street. I went down one day and preached down there. And I must admit it was a new experience for me. I mean, I preach in the street a lot, but never have I preached three inches from a guy I've known. I mean, you Yankees up here are crazy, man. I mean, you go down there, they're preaching down there right in front of the guy's face getting off the bus, you know, like that. I had a, I had a Catholic lady stand right in front of me yelling at me all the time I was preaching, you know, about three feet from me. And one of those girls down there, the one down with us, I forget whose wife she was, but some guy came up and pulled a switchblade in her, put it right in her face. 
and you say one more word, I'll cut your throat. She just stuck a track in the end of the blade. And said, read that. <laughs> he went and read the thing. Now you take that kind of thing there, that's that persecution. That, she took that chinically. See? Now God is looking for a man who can get in jail like Paul and Silas and then sing when he gets in jail. What fool can't sing when everything is okay? Okay, so you arrived in the jet at 32,000 feet deep in the state. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Amen, brother. And you get out and find you lost your notes. And they lost your sermon notes. And then you got a Asiatic flu in the hotel. And you stay in bed all day and take the medicine. Come to church at night and hack and spit and cough behind the board. And like to pass out. And then what? Then what? Hallelujah. Glory to God. I preach in places after an operation on a wisdom tooth where I was spitting blood through the whole thing, man, with a towel there wiping the blood. I preach in places where I fainted in the in the in the in the pulpit in the middle of the message. But I began to sink. I said to Father, would you please lead us in prayer, brother? And then I just dropped my knees and crawl out the back, came to and crawl back in again. Now the thing is, the thing is, I know how we are. When I say we, I mean I've got some things I've got to learn here too. When was the last time you really praised God, brother, when you had a flat tire and were in a hurry to get someplace and go make you late? Yeah. Yeah. Now those are the kind of tests. And those are little tests. George Wallace uh, lost his health and wound up in a wheelchair just trying to do something he thought ought to be done. I didn't hear a whine publicly or privately from that time to this from him. I think he's a saved man. He's a Methodist, but I think he's saved. But I know saved people couldn't take that. You take when Goldwater ran for president a couple of years back, they called him everything but white. They intimated he was a homosexual and God knows what because the guy was a conservative. I never heard Goldwater squawk from that time and complain about the way the press treated him. As far as I know, he was an unsaved man. Uh, I don't think it's how you can win. I wish to God, I wish to God when we beat the Russian hockey team, I wish those fellows had just kept quiet. Our team. And just skated off the field and just said bye-bye. That's when you rub it in, boy. Amen. But when you start hollering and shouting and messing around like a bunch of monkeys, you show what you are. You show that you were afraid you might lose. And you're worried about it. And you got through by the skin of your teeth. You don't agree with that philosophy? Well, you're wrong. <laughs> and I'm right. Because, boys, you're not going to win them all. You're not going to win them all. Jack Hyle, one of his books, said, I teach my boys to be winners. I teach my boys to never have to be losers. They can always win. That's a lie. That's a lie. You fellows may win in your home. You may have a fine Christian wife and fine healthy children. You may lose spiritually and never do nothing for God for 50 years. You may be a soul winner and be right with the Lord and this night have to declare bankruptcy someday. Maybe you get along good with the money and get along good with the Lord and God will use you and all that and you'll be sick and deathly sick and bothered with some infirmity all your life. Nobody backs a thousand, boys. Nobody. But nobody. But nobody. You find some big old strong healthy cuss and think, boy, a man, a fellow in perfect health, you know, and built like a bull ape, boy, got the world a string. You find some little old woman who's got him down there in a court and get $10,000 a year out. You ain't going to win them all. And the question going to come up is how you're going to take it when you get it. That remind me to say about the ninth man, God is looking for a man who praises God in any trouble. In any trouble. Praises God in any trouble. Not just take the persecution cheerfully, but go beyond that. Praise God when the trouble comes. That's Paul and Silas in, in jail. I asked the little boy one time, did he pray every day? He said, not every day. And he said, some days I don't need anything. <laughs> some Christians are like that. Or at times when you pray when you need something. To praise God in trouble. I, I have to preach to myself about these things. I remember my wife deserted me years ago. It's been years now, 1959, 60 in there somewhere. 20, what is that, 22, 23, 24 years ago, 
My enemies always make it sound like, oh, you know, Brother Ruckman, you know, he just dumped his wife, ran off with his secretary and all that stuff. How many of you ever heard that stuff? You ever see anything like that? Yeah, five or six years. Well, those little muckraking, filthy mouth liars, they haven't got any sense. And I'm just broad mind enough to pray for them and hope that God doesn't do to them what he did to me. Uh, my wife left me in 1959. I didn't marry until 1972. I went 13 years by myself, boy, with five children. Five children. And the youngest a year and a half. You want to try it? Try it. I tell you, boy, I got pastor. You ever pastor a church as a single man? Don't try it if you can get out of it. I mean, I thought when I was, you know, 40 years old, I thought, man, 40 years old with no kids, won't be any women bothering me. Man, they were doing everything but parachuting down the chimney, man. <laughs> <laughs> and you go through that kind of stuff, and I remember right after that thing happened, I had a meeting up in, in the mission with Garland and Cofield. He was the Rose Park Baptist Church in Holland, Michigan. And I was on the bottom, boy. I was on the bottom. I mean, I was throwing my Bible around the room and growling in my beard, you know, and praying, wondering why God didn't answer, you know, and going to the Psalms, hear me speedily, all that stuff, you know. You ever give one of them messages? And I got going through that, I wasn't getting anywhere. And about that time, this pastor, Brother Cofield, said to me one night at the table, he said, Have you thanked God for it yet? I said, What? <laughs> He said, have you thanked God for it yet? And the thought of suddenly occurred to me, I hadn't. Most peculiar thing. And after all this teaching, you know, be thankful for everything, be careful for nothing, you know, and all that kind of stuff you teach them. And the first thing you know, the thing happens, and you, you have, you're you not practicing what you preach. And she'd been gone about two weeks, and I said to him, well, I said, that's the kind of thing you can thank God for. <laughs> got mad, you know, went out. And I got alone, I repented. And I said, okay, Lord, thank you. And I said, I don't understand it. I don't know how anybody could thank God for a thing like that, but you said, and everything give thanks, so I'm giving thanks. And I gave thanks. And from that time on, the thing began to pick up a little bit, and after a while, the Lord worked it out. Of course, it's after a while. After a while, in that case, it was a pretty long time. All right, finally. God is looking for a man who is not ashamed of Jesus Christ. If not only we need men who give the glory to God, if we need men who speak up for Jesus Christ. Amen. Our founding fathers that founded this country didn't have that much guts. When Jefferson and Adams and that bunch sat down and drew up the declaration, they lacked, they lacked courage. And they sat down there and they wouldn't put the name of Jesus Christ in your constitution. In the preamble of your constitution and the constitution, the Bill of Rights, the name of Jesus Christ doesn't occur one time. They say silence is is golden. Sometimes silence is yellow. How about this? How about a dollar, gentlemen? How about a dollar for every word you've said this year for Jesus Christ? Could you put much money in the bank tomorrow or Monday? How about a dollar? Put it this way. Lord, give you one buck for every time you said something for Jesus Christ in the last 20 years. And gave you one buck for everything you said every time you said something about something else for the last 20 years. I wonder how the pile of money would come out. Some of your fellows, now you don't mean this, but some of your fellows, you know what your witness is like? Some of you fellows, I'm not getting all of you, some of you got a real good witness. Thank God you do. But some of your fellows' witness is like a, is like a caterpillar going across a Persian rug with sneakers on. <laughs> You just can't hear a thing. <laughs> it's just so quiet and nice, it just doesn't upset anybody. It's a shame. What God wants the men who are not ashamed of Jesus Christ. I'll give you two of them and I'll be through. Years ago out in Hollywood, there's a fellow called Jim Voss. And Jim Voss is saved now, and I guess he's still alive somewhere. He was a wiretapper for Mickey Cohen. He was a gangster. His daddy was a preacher. And we went off to Bible school. He got shipped from Bible school for stealing money. He got in the army, got kicked out of the army for stealing, spent time in the slammer. Jim Boss was a wiretapper for Mickey Cohen. He had a thing worked up on race tracks where he could get the news of a winner from a race from one coast and get the news of that winner to a better on the east coast 
a minute and a half before the window closed. <laughs> well, they were betting. So the guy betting here could bet on the window over here, pick the thing up by by electronics, pick the thing up before the before the they closed down the betting booth. And they caught him on that. He went to the slammer for that. And that fellow went on like that for years. He had things rigged out where a fellow come by your hotel room and put a cane against the door in the hallway, uh, the door, door in the hallway, and they could hear every word you said in that room. And they had that electronic stuff going 20 years before most of them had it going. He had things going where you want to catch a couple in a hotel or a motel, you get this camera and put it a, oh, eighth of a mile off and get everything going on. Blackmail, folks. And then finally, with a big fine coming up and embezzling 300,000 bucks and stealing $20,000 worth of equipment, Billy Graham came to Los Angeles. And Jim Voss heard that uh, Stu Hammond got saved. Stu Hammond ran a racetrack, ran race horses. And when he heard that Stu Hammond got saved, Jim Voss said that he sell his horses. And they said he sold his horses. And Jim Voss said, I don't believe it. And they finally had to sell his horses and Stu... Jim Boss went down to the tent that night and heard Billy Graham preach, and he said, if anybody touches me, he said, I hit him. Nobody touched him. And the next night he came down again and wouldn't go forward, but that night he got saved. And he went back that night, walked the floor that night, and his wife asked him what was wrong, and he said, I've been saved. And she was just shouting. She was so happy, and then she noticed he wasn't shouting and wasn't happy. And she said, what is it? He said, we've got a trial coming up. I'm here for 20000 here, 300000 here. And he said, I've been praying, and God telling me to cut loose from the gang and get out of the gang. She said, well, do what God tells you to do. He phoned up Mickey Cohen and said, I'm going to quit. Mickey Cohen said, is that right? And he said, yes, and hung up the phone. And about 20 minutes later, he got a phone from Cohen's hitman, Andy. And he phoned him and said, you're quitting, are you, Jimmy? He said, I'm getting out. And Andy said, nobody quits on Andy. Me and the boys are going to pay you a visit. That old boy, after his wife went to sleep, he got up and prayed over his wife and prayed over his sleeping baby and claimed the promise and the word of God. And the next day he met Andy and talked with him 30 minutes in a hotel and talked him out of killing him and left. And the FBI said if he'd been one day later a day later, when Andy was there, if then a day later he'd have been killed, a rival mob met Andy in the hotel room the next day and shot. They had a shootout there. He'd been killed if he'd met him a day later. And he went back to Mickey Cohen and Mickey Cohen and said, all right, Jim, you're going to get out and break clean. We'll break clean. Promise me one thing. He said, promise me you won't ever get in this kind of work again. And Jim said, okay, and went to court. And the people that had him for 300 fouls let him off the hook. And the guy that stole the equipment, when he finally was converted, he was a Christian and forgave him. And the judge got there at the end of the thing, and he tried to pronounce a sentence, and he said, well, this case is dismissed since you uh, 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 saw the light. And Paul shook his head. And the judge said, since you, you got religion? And he shook his head. <laughs> and the judge well, well, since you, he said, you walked the soda, and Jim shook his head. And the judge said, well, since you, and Jim Boss said, since I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. <laughs> That's what God wants. A man is not ashamed of Jesus Christ. I'll give you one more. In this country, we had a fellow named Percy Crawford. Is he still alive, Percy Crawford? Percy Crawford used to work with Jack Wordson, music man. These young people in New York, I think upstate New York someplace. And Percy Crawford was led to Christ back in 1932 by a fellow named William Nicholson. You don't know William Nicholson, so I'll tell you about it. William Nicholson was born in North Island, son of a sea captain. When he was a young man, he ran away to sea and then got kicked out of the merchant marine because he was too young, went back and joined again. When he was about 17, he got down to South Africa and got in a terrible shipwreck where the cargo got loose in the ship and busted legs and tore off heads and on the legs all in every place. And he got ashore on the shipwreck and couldn't get back to North Island. Got a job working out, out there in the mines in South Africa. He worked there. When he was 20, he came back home to his mother. Wild, rough life. Mother been praying for him all the time. He had been home a month when they were sitting at the breakfast table eating. And Nicholson said, I was getting ready to spoon down my mush. And a voice said, oh boy, it's now or never. <laughs> right there at the table, he asked Christ to save him while he was eating his mush. And then he put out his spoon, looked at his mother, and she looked at him and said, what's happened? He said, I've got saved. 
And she screamed, when? And he said, right now. <laughs> and she got hugging his neck and everything, and then he began to live for the Lord, and his life went up and it went down, mountaintop experience, valley, and that goes. And he tried to get established and couldn't get sound in the faith. Finally came up a preaching of Andrew Murray, who got him pretty well stabilized, but he didn't have any peace. And he couldn't get victory. He'd go down the order and surrender and surrender. No victory and no victory. Worry about what people thought about him. Worry about his testimony and this and that. And when he got near distraction, he went to Andrew Murray and asked what to do. And Murray said, tell you what, next time a Salvation Army unit goes downtown to preach in the street, you go down with them. And he went down there all the next night and knelt down and said, Lord, I'll go to Shanghai or Timbuktu or anything to get peace. But not that. <coughs> And the next day, the unit that went down was a major and one of the Salvation Army girls and an old saved punch drunk bum called Daft Jimmy. And Nicholson said he didn't have enough brains to get a headache. <laughs> and, he said, and they said, let's go downtown, Nicholson, and preach on the street. And Nicholson said, you talk about dying? He said, I died a thousand deaths. And he said, all my friends were standing around there looking at me, and I had nothing I could do. I mean, six feet tall, 280 pounds, mine in Africa, sea captain. And he started down the street, a little girl beating the tambourine, and Daft Jiminy holding a flag. And the flag I had it on it, it was white yarn and red letters on it, it said, Save from Public Opinion. <laughs> And they got downtown and preached, and Nichols stood there just, just in a, just in a sweat, about to faint. And finally, the army captain or major of the Salvation Army turned and said, "Brother Nicholson, lead us in prayer." And Nichols said, "You talk about dying." He said, "You don't know what dying is." And he said, "I got on his knee in the street. He had these Catholics around there making fun of him, jeering at him, laughing at him. A couple of fellows used to drink with us down there, cussing him, laughing at him." And he said, but he prayed he got it, he shaking him head to foot, and the major said, okay, he said, we've had our service now. He said, you take the tambourine, <laughs> gave the tambourine to Nicholson, and said, lead the way back to the barracks. And Nicholson said, he took that tambourine, looked at that dumb stumble bum standing beside him, that little old girl, about 15 to 16 years old, all those people up there on the street, and suddenly he said to himself, I can't let a little girl out to me. And he turned around and said, forward, <laughs> began to bang that tambourine. <laughs> and he said, I lost two things in two minutes that had bothered me all my life. He said, I lost my reputation. <laughs> <laughs> and I lost my fear of man. He lost him in two minutes. That's the old boy led Percy Crawford to Christ. You know how he lost him? He lost him by not being ashamed of Jesus Christ. And those are the men the Lord looking for. All right. Father, bless the message tonight. We've got men here, plenty of them. Enough males here, Lord. God, take four or five towns like this and turn them upside down for Christ. But we're not what we ought to be. They're not what they ought to be. If every man in this place was as sold out as General William Booth and Dwight L. Moody and John Patton, would be another story. And Lord, I pray that out of this group here, you'll find what you want. These pictures you put up in the post office. Want them dead or alive. We know you want these men. You want them alive for your service. You want them dead to sin, dead to the world. And Lord, give them these qualities that you want men. Because the psalmist said, help, Lord, the godly man ceases. And Lord, we're in trouble. We're in trouble when we lose our godly man. I know some of you have bowed my eyes closed here a few minutes. And I'm not going to ask anybody forward here tonight. Let's just pray a little while. And listen, while we're in prayer, are there any saved men here tonight who raise a hand and say, Preacher, I know of an unsaved man that's here in the meeting tonight. I know of at least one. If you know of at least one for certain, would you raise your hand? They like that here tonight. You know of at least one here for certain. All right, I suppose you're all saved. Let's just pray a while. I want you to do this. I want you to ask God to make you to be 
Now listen to me. God to make you to be the kind of man he wants you to be. You don't have to copy me, anybody else. You be the kind of man God wants you to be. You'll have to have these principles I'm talking about tonight. You'll have to have all ten of them. But that doesn't mean you have to be rough or crude like Ruckman, or loud and noisy like some of us fellas. You can be gentle. You can be sweet. You can be kind. And for Jesus Christ, you can be a roaring lion. You ask God to help you to be the kind of man he wants you to be. Father, help these men here tonight. I know they're all different kinds. All these women look different, one look different, and all is about the same. And these men all look the same, and there are not any two of them even like each other. If I learn one thing from life, Lord, I've learned that. That's why the lady gets so upset when some of the lady wears the same dress, the same hat. They want it so hard to be different. These men don't have to be different. They're already different. And I know you've got jobs for them I couldn't do and people to deal with I couldn't deal with and things to do I could never accomplish. And I just pray for every man in this building I heard me tonight will wind up before you come as the kind of man you want him to be. And I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. All right, brother, come ahead. You know, in closing, I want to say just this, brother, grace comes. I get I hear a lot of criticism about preachers and about the Lord's people. I do a good bit of it myself. But I want you to know something. I want you to know that I know some men in this country that are the right kind of men. And if every man in this country were like some of my friends are, nobody would have to shut the door in the house when they went to bed at night. My friends, I could name you ten men right now that are my personal friends, ten of them. And if every man in America lived just like those men live, you wouldn't have to roll up the windows in your car when you park your car in a parking lot. And if you, every man, I, I could recommend the lie of those ten men to any male thing in this country. If everybody in this country lived like those ten friends of mine, I have in mind, I could name them to you. If they looked like those 10 men, the government would save $150 billion a year on crime. $150 billion a year. There are some godly men left, but God help us when they cease. Brother? Amen. Well, that's good. It's good for us as, as men.